Um, you guys do me a favor and turn in your Bibles to, um, oh, let's see, how about John chapter 18? Um, this, this message is, um, it, it's, it's kind of, I want to let you know something up front, I guess. Uh, there's going to be a very tiny little bit of a political rant in, in this message. It's not bad, it's not party related or anything like that, but there's going to be a little, um, a little bit about our political climate, our political world included in today's message here. And so I just want to let you know that up front. But, uh, you know, I think that it's an interesting conversation that we can all engage in if we were to ask this question. What's wrong with the world today? I mean, that's a, that's a huge question, isn't it? What's wrong with the world today? Um, just... This is dangerous, but just a couple of responses. Raise your hand and tell me. What's wrong with the world today, Dick? Sin. Sin. Yes. No God in their life. life. What's your name, by the way? Jody. Jody? It's great to have you here, Jody. Um, Who else? What's wrong with the world today? Yes, you in the back. Yes, ma'am. Yep. Absolutely. Wonderful. Dean? Being self-centered. What's that? It's funny, everybody else is raising their hand. Maggie's just up here having a conversation with me. She doesn't, she doesn't care about the rest of you. Way to follow instructions, Maggie. Kids these days. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're right. Who else? A couple other ones. Yes. An entitlement mentality. Okay, great. Who else? Interesting, isn't it? I, and I think there's, there's many of you that are afraid to raise your hand or just belt it out like others do. Um, but, but I think that something enters most of our minds. We all have an opinion with what do we think it is that's wrong with the world today as we look at our culture, our society, maybe not the world as much as our country or our state or our communities or even the church. What's wrong with it? And, and I, like many of you, happen to have an opinion about that. And, and that's really part of where this message comes from. However, it absolutely has to do with being a Christian and being a follower of Jesus I believe that a huge problem today, and, and, and kind of it, it encompasses all of the responses, it's selfishness. Is that so many of us, our first response to so many of the situations we find ourselves in is, what about me? How is this going to benefit me? What's best for me? And, and honestly, this is the little political part of it. Friends, I want to encourage you with something today. I stand up here and I have a pretty strong opinion about about who I'd like to see in the White House, or maybe who I wouldn't like to see in the White House. But I'm not going to share my opinion of who with you. What I'm going to do is challenge you with something. It's easy in the political environment that we're in today to be selfish. It's very easy. Number one, to vote who is going to be, who am I going to put there that's going to be the most beneficial to me personally as opposed to who's the best candidate for our country. Whether you're looking at our governor or a city council person or a president of the United States, it's easy for our first mindset to go to, well, who is going to benefit me personally? I'm going to take all of this other stuff off the table and just say, who benefits me personally? And that's a very selfish mindset. I want to challenge you with something. All of us, as you look at the candidates, and again, whether it be the president, all the way down through to local local positions, who benefits us as a people? Not who continues to write my check, not who continues to have this and who continues to have this. That's a selfish mindset. And if all of us do that, the country is going to go in a bad direction. But if we look at it from the standpoint of what's best for the people, What's best for the people? Even if, even if it comes at a, at a small sacrifice to myself personally, what's best for us as a country? What's best for us as a state? That's one part. The second part of this political thing is this. It's going to be equally easy for us to be selfish and say, you know what? I'm so frustrated politically right now, I just don't want anything to do with it. And so I'm just going to stay home on that day on that Tuesday in November. I'm just going to stay home. I'm just going to have nothing to do with it. And friends, I want to encourage you with something. Man, that's selfish. It's selfish because all that's doing is satisfying you. 
we have the opportunity, we have the privilege to vote, the right to vote. And there are people who have died so that we can have that right. And, and here's the deal. Whether you and I will agree or not, and I know this, we are a Pentecostal church, charismatic, Bible-believing church, but I also know that we are probably split right down the middle in this room when it comes to our political affiliation. Friends, I don't care who you vote for. I do care, but I can't tell you I care. So I don't care who you vote for. But here's the important thing I want you to hear is this. Don't just say I'm frustrated so I'm going to stay home. Go vote. And I'm telling you this now in August because between August and November, you have an opportunity to educate yourselves on who you're going to vote for. Don't be selfish and just say, hey, I'm just going to stay home because I'm irritated. Because then, th then what happens? You have to live with the results of something that you didn't engage in. We have the opportunity to engage. Amen? And I want to encourage you, even now, be preparing that even though you're frustrated, you're going to go and you're going to find yourselves at your community center on that Tuesday in November and you're going to vote. Amen? Amen. Selfishness. Selfishness. It's something that, that permeates us as a culture. It permeates us as a church all around. It just gets in and I think it just can start deteriorating things when our first mindset and our first response is, it's all about me. And, and, and I'm going to look at a few different scriptures today because my understanding, and again, Ron, correct me if I'm wrong through any of this, okay? But my understanding is, is that as a Christian, there is a target that I have. There is a goal that I have, and that is to, to model my life after that of Jesus Christ. Amen? We agree with that? Jody? Amen. You guys, here's the thing. If I'm supposed to be like Jesus, Jesus is the ultimate example of selflessness. But amidst our churches, it is, we're, we are just, um, we're so filled with selfishness. And people see this. And that's kind of what I want to challenge us with today is, is this whole idea of being selfless, uh, selfless as a Christian. As a believer, as somebody who wants to follow Jesus about being selfless. In John chapter 18, uh, verses 1 through 18, and these chunks of scripture we're going to read today, um, they're, they're a little bit lengthy. Mallory, would you do me a favor and turn these lights up just a little bit? Just I can't see very clearly. Um, John chapter 18, uh, starting in verse 1. Jesus is arrested. And, and, and I want to tell you again, uh, I've, you've heard me say this before. A lot of the messages that we get, they come out of my devotions. They come out of my regular reading of the Bible. You guys, it's important to be reading your Bibles. John chapter 18, starting in verse 1. So Jesus has, has done his ministry. He's been going on a few years. And now he's in a position where he's going to be arrested. So starting in verse 1 of John 18, it says this. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the, the uh, Kidron Valley on the other side there was an olive grove, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the grove, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees. They were carrying torches and lanterns and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, he went out and he asked them, now, now, there's little tidbits here that are important. Jesus knew what the road he was about to walk down. Jesus knows the outcome of these statements that he's about to make. So Jesus goes out to them and he says, who is it that you want? He sees this, this group of people, these temple guards, these soldiers. He sees a disciple. He sees and he knows what's going to happen. He goes out to meet them and he says, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he. Jesus said, and Judas the traitor was standing there with him. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and they fell to the ground. What's interesting about this is these same people that are going out to arrest him have been watching him for a few years. They've likely seen him heal people, maybe even some of their friends, right? They've seen this Jesus do this stuff, and so Jesus now, he's admitting, I I'm the one you're here to arrest, I, that's me. And so they back away and they, and they fell to the ground. And again he asked them, Who is it that you want? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he, Jesus answered. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. 
This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those that you have gave me. So here's Jesus now. And again, you guys, remember this idea. He's a real guy, right? The Bible's pretty clear about that, that he's as human as I am in his feeling, in his emotion, right? In the physical aspect of his body, he, he felt everything. So what he knows he's about to endure, what he knows he's about to go to, it's not like he's sitting there and he's thinking, yeah, this is great, it's going to look good, but I'm not going to feel any of it because I'm God. Jesus came fully human. He was born no different than Jason was born. He walked through life no different than you and I have walked through life. He was tempted. He, all of these things that you and I experience, he's experienced. Grief, anger. Jesus is human. And so Jesus, in that humanity, he knows what he's about to walk through. He knows what's going to happen by him stepping up and saying, man, it's me, it's me. I'm the one you're looking for. I'm the one you're here to take off and whip and beat and crucify. It's me. And what stuck out to me, Dick, was this one statement that Jesus makes in the garden. As Jesus is stepping forward and he is saying, who are you looking for? I'm looking for Jesus of Nazareth. Well, that's me. They don't do anything. Who is it you're looking for? We're looking for this Jesus, the Nazarene. I told you, it's me. Now let them go. And he steps up and selflessly, and this is what stuck out to me and, and made, it was like, this is what I'm going to talk about today. Jason, he selflessly steps up and he says, I'm the one you want. Let these guys go. I'm the one you want. Now, again, I, I can't em emphasize enough that he's human in this. He's as human as you and I are. He, he really is. And sometimes I think we forget that fact. We forget that he's a man. He was a boy. I look at Levi and Matthias sitting here. He was a young man, just like these guys are. Probably had the hair just about as cool as those two as well. But Jesus is human. You see, sometimes I think what we do when we read our Bibles and we see these red letters, and by the way, if you have a red letter Bible, the red letters, those are the words that Jesus spoke. That's what those red letters mean. But sometimes when we read our Bibles, Leah, we come across these red letters, we kind of dismiss them when it's something that we, we might feel because we think, well, he, he's not me. He doesn't know the frustrations that Dan has. He doesn't know the pain that Jody has. He doesn't know the fears that Brad has, the insecurities that Deanne has. He doesn't know. that He can't relate to any of this stuff because he wasn't really human. And you guys, it's so important that we remember this. The Bible tells us this. Right, Dilly? Jesus is human. Jesus is as human as you and I are. And so when we look at a statement like this, Bob, where Jesus says, hey, I'm the one you want. As he's looking at weapons and torches and lanterns and mean guys, guys that he's seen whip and beat people, Jesus in all of his humanity knows exactly the road he's about to walk down. And still, he steps forward and he says, it's me. I'm the one you want, now let these guys go. And I can't help but think how many of us would have kind of tucked tail and been like, man, I'm going to hide behind Peter. <laughs> You know, he's, he's outspoken. He doesn't think before he acts. Odds are he's going to do something stupid and I'm out. I'm going to sneak out this way. We would have been looking for a way for us to get out. Do you understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense? We have better been looking for our out instead of being the one that stepped forward. And I'm not saying all of us, but it would have been inside of us. It would have been inside of us, Brandon, to look for that, that out. Where's the hat, by the way, today? I'm kind of disappointed when I saw you walk in. Being selfless. And you guys, I want to come back to this very simple idea of what it means to be a Christian. Being a Christian doesn't mean going to church. Being a Christian doesn't mean raising your hands during worship. Being a Christian, it doesn't mean you read your Bible. Being a Christian, it means that I'm surrendering my life to Jesus, and I want to be like him, as like him as I can. Amen? I mean, at the core of what it is, all of these other things are good and they're important to, to keep us going in the right direction, but at the bottom line where we meet the road, it's I want to be like Jesus. And Jesus is selfless. And Jesus, he doesn't think of himself first. He thinks of others first. It turns me to Luke chapter 23. This is a scripture and this is a, this is a, a, a chunk of, of this story that it always gets me because I, this is the kind of thing that I fail miserably at. I just fail miserably at it because I struggle with people sometimes. People are frustrating, aren't they? 
That was a little quick, Maggie. Um, they are. People are frustrating. Man, raise your hand if anybody's ever hurt or disappoint you. Disappointed you. Raise your hand. That's great. Dan, that's great that nobody has ever disappointed you or hurt you. That's awesome. That a boy. So glad you're sitting in the front. You guys, people are so stinking frustrating. They hurt us. They disappoint us. They do things to us that we could never imagine. And then it goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on. In the example, Jesus being selfless at a time when if I'm Jesus, I, I, all I can think is I'd be so stinking angry. I'd be so hurt. I'd, I would, I'd be filled with so many different things. And, and the, the stuff that Jesus says at this moment, it absolutely baffles me. Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 26. Jesus has been arrested. He's been whipped. He's been beaten. He's dragged the cross. I mean, all of this stuff is going on right now. Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 26. Uh, 26 excuse me. As they led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in uh, from the country. And they put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and walked for him, uh, excuse me, and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, and again, you guys, just this small statement right here, it says he's not thinking of himself. And in the state that he is in right now, it's unimaginable to you and me. It's unimaginable where he's at physically, emotionally, I mean mentally, spiritually, the anguish that he has gone through in the last 24 hours of his life. It's unimaginable. If you think of the difficulty that you have had in life, that I have had in life, where Jesus finds himself at this moment when he says these words, it's unimaginable to me and you. You guys, you got to remember, again, I can't emphasize this enough in this message. Dave, this guy is as human as you are. That's Jesus. He is human. He feels things. He has been whipped, shredded. I mean, shredded. He's been spat upon. He's been laughed at. He's been mocked. He's been denied. He's been turned on. Everything that you can imagine in the last 12 to 24 hours has taken place in this guy's body and in this guy's mind. And then he says these words. It's absolutely amazing to me. All of these people are following him because he's, he's walking through town now to get just outside the walls where he can be nailed to a cross and crucified. And these people, some of his followers, they're just bawling, they're wailing, they're mourning, they're crying out. And Jesus says this. He says, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Don't think about me in this situation. Look beyond me, even though he's going through what he's going through. He says, weep for yourselves. And for your children, for the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the barren women, the wombs that have never bore, and the breasts that have never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if men do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? If they do this stuff when it's decent, what's going to happen when it's really bad? He's looking beyond himself. He's looking beyond his own circumstances. And he's saying, don't, don't think about me right now. But think about you. Verse 32, it says this, Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, where they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left, Jesus said this, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. And you can imagine the way they're saying this stuff, right? But here's Jesus. He's being mocked. He's being ridiculed. He's being, he's being laughed at. He's still being spat upon. All of this stuff is happening. And Jesus, being fully human, enduring all of this stuff, he still gets himself to this place where selflessly he thinks of others. Where he says, Father, forgive them. And I'm going to tell you guys something. 
I'm right there, the only thing I'm saying is, Lord, strike them dead. I'm thinking, God, where's the lightning? Father, you love me. You take these people out. You, you know why I know I'd be doing that? Because I've done it. I have felt that feeling, and internally, I have prayed that prayer. God, these people are hurting me. These people are hurting my family. God, what they're doing is ridiculous. Man, take them out. <laughs> and it's a very real thing. But again, here's Jesus getting himself to the point, even with what he's going through. And, and if you don't know the story, you guys, the Bible says that at this point, Jesus is so whipped and so beaten that he's unrecognizable as a man. Do you understand that? That's where we find Jesus. Y you guys, are you grasping where he's at right now? I don't, I don't think my words are doing it. I see some of you, you're kind of glossing off. You're looking over here, you're looking over here. I want you to understand something. This is real. This isn't a fairy tale book. This isn't a made up Dr. Seuss thing. As real as it can be, if we all took Bob and we started dragging him down the street and we were whipping him, and we were beating him, and we were stabbing him, and we were shredding him, as real as Bob in, is, and what Bob would feel, that's what Jesus felt. And he gets to this point where he still says, Father, forgive them. He looks beyond himself, and he says, Father, forgive them. That's being selfless. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine and vinegar, and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly. For we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Do you understand that? Jesus is hanging on the cross. Jesus is going through all of this stuff. He doesn't even deserve it. And he still says this, Father, forgive them. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. As a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, my goal is not my church attendance. My goal is not to be part of the worship team. It's not to go on a mission trip. My goal is not to, not to create this list of what I've done, the scriptures I have memorized, these messages I have preached. My goal is to be as much like Christ as I can be. That's my goal. And you guys, we talk about sin and we talk about godlessness in our society. I believe so strongly that if believers focused on being like Jesus, things would start to change. And it would start in our churches. If believers said, I want to be like Jesus. You guys remember this scripture we've talked about the last few, few weeks. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 says, I want to know Christ. The Apostle Paul is saying this, I want to know Jesus. Friends, you want to know Jesus. How, how are we supposed to be like him if we don't know him? Not just surrendering our lives, but going beyond that and reading this kind of stuff. Getting in the word and saying, this is, this is Jesus. This is who I want to be like. I see him in this situation. I understand that this is as real as it gets. When I'm so frustrated with my kids and I absolutely lose control, I don't want to be like that anymore. I want to be like Jesus I want to be in control and I want to think, yeah, this is wrong, but I'm going to think of their feelings and I'm going to think of their emotions and I'm going to think of their well-being. I'm not going to be selfish in this. As kids, as kids to look at how you treat your parents, how you treat your grandparents, how you treat your siblings, to think, you know what, even in these relationships, I want to be like Jesus. Right, Brandon? When I think of how I'm going to treat my mom and dad, I want to be like Jesus, even though I'm, are you 15? I, I couldn't know if it was 12 or 15. I knew it was one of the two. But even as a 15-year-old young man who has all of these things in our society beaten down on him, man, I'm not going to tell these lies. 
I'm not going to do these things. Why? Because I want to be like Jesus. I want to honor my mother and father. That's who I want to be. To be like Jesus. You guys, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. This is a, a letter from the Apostle Paul to the church in Philippi, and, and it's, it's such a great encouragement of, of how we are not just to live, but the attitude that we're supposed to have. Because this, this really comes down to, this whole message, it comes down to our attitude. And, and really, it stems back to this lesson we all learned in kindergarten, if not before. It's in Luke chapter 6, verse 31. Don't, don't turn there, but it's kind of the golden rule. And it's crazy. It's a really crazy one. It's another soapbox that I like to get on um, in all aspects of life. It says something along the lines of doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. What an interesting concept that is. Matthias, what if every time before we did something, we thought of that? Every time we're going to do something to a sibling, to a friend, if you're married, the way you're going to treat your spouse, the way you're going to interact with other people knowing your spouse is there, the way that you're going to treat your kids, how is it going to make them feel? How do you want to be treated? Even as a young person, how do you want your parents to treat you and how do you want your kids to treat you? Just thinking through all of these situations and trying to understand, wait a minute, is this, is what I'm about to say to this person when I call them an idiot, do I like it when I'm called an idiot? No, I don't. So then why does that so freely come off my mouth? As a parent, when I tell my kids, are you that stupid? Seriously, seriously, are you that stupid that you're going to do this? And you're going to say that to your 14-year-old or your 12-year-old or your 16-year-old or your 7-year-old. Are you that stupid? Well, what if I said that to you? What if you came into my office and you said, Pastor Bill, man, I'm going through a hard time. Man, I'm, I, I was doing fine, but I am so steeped in this pornography addiction now, I just, I can't get control of it. What if my response to you as the pastor was like, are you kidding me? Are you that stupid? Are you that much of an idiot that you're going to let yourself go back down that road? Seriously, are you serious? Are you that stupid? How's it feel? Just hearing me say it like this, it's like, Ugh. Brad, does that feel good? Levi, does that feel good hearing me talk like that? Does it? It doesn't. It doesn't. And so here's the challenge. We talk like that to people in our lives. We call them idiots. We tell them they're morons. And we don't do it jokingly. We tear people apart. So there's the question, how do you like that? See, friends, it's very selfish when we do that to people because it only satisfies one. It can feel pretty good, can it? It can feel really good to verbally just tear somebody apart. But it's selfish because that's all it does is satisfy something in you. But in the meantime, you are destroying somebody else. Do we like it when we, talk, when we hear that from our siblings? Brandon, would you like it if your mom talked to you that way? No. You guys, it's a very real part of life, and how do we treat people? Do we treat people how we would want to be treated? Because oftentimes we do it out of selfishness instead of selflessness. And that's the example that Jesus sets for us. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It says this, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. You see, friends, the way we treat other people, oftentimes it's out of that selfish ambition. One of my big things that I'm on lately is gossiping about people. When we gossip about somebody, that satisfies us. Amen? Right? I'm satisfied if I go to Connie and I tell her, man, you wouldn't believe what I heard about Jody. Because you know what I'm doing now? I'm putting myself in a position of being in the know. And that is an extremely selfish behavior. 
Paul says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. How is what I'm going to do or say or act, how is it going to affect that person? Even if they're not standing there. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Verse 5. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. Man, if you have your own Bibles there, I would encourage you to underline that statement right there. Even memor uh, memorize it. Philippians 2.5. My attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. Filled with humility. Now he goes on to explain Jesus' attitude. It says this, Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. He became human. Amen? Ron, is that right? Are you going to let me know still if I'm off base here? Okay, thank you. Somebody write that in the minutes. Ron said I'm doing fine. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. He made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. You guys, if there's a guy that should come with pomp and circumstance and wanting trumpets and, and people to make his meals and serve him coffee and fix his bed and do all these things, it's Jesus. Amen? If there's anybody that deserves it, it's Jesus. But he counts all of that nothing. Kind of like Paul was saying, I count all of these other things a loss compared to knowing Jesus. Jesus comes and he gives all of that stuff up. Do you know why? Because he wants you to see him. Because he wants to be able to relate. He made himself human. And being found in presence as a man, he humbled himself and he became obedient to death. Even death on a cross. The humility, the humiliating death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, 5. My attitude should be that of Christ. One filled with humility. And you guys, here's the, here's the point that I want to challenge us with today is this point. And I say it often. We do this good at church on Sunday morning. We do this good when we go on our mission trips. We do this good when, when we're in that church setting. But you guys, I want to push and push and push us to go so far beyond our Christian circles. I want us to have the mind of Christ when we're being crucified. I want us to have the mind of Christ when we're in the lion's den. That's when I want us to have the mind of Christ. What do we do, even though we know others are talking bad about us? What do we do with it? Even, even though we know our kids are acting like the devil himself, what do we do with it? Even though our spouse is treating us like dirt, what do we do with it? You guys, this is, these are the times. Our coworkers, even though our coworkers are, are just so ridiculous, what do we do with those situations? How do we, in that time, have the mind of Christ? And you guys, in a sermon on Sunday morning, I cannot address every single situation that you and I are going to find ourselves in tomorrow morning. I can't do it. But during this time of worship that we're about to have, that's what I would love to have you focus on. In my life, in your life, God, help me to see the ways that I need to improve and have the mind of Christ. Because you know, ultimately, what my goal is as a Christian, my goal is that others would know Jesus. That's what it always comes back to, you guys. We are his witnesses. We are his ambassadors. We are his love letter to those around us. So is how I'm living my life this witness. Not am I perfect, because none of us will ever be perfect. And if we wait to be perfect, to be the witness, we're, 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 fail we're missing the entire thing. But as I continue to work forward, as I continue to try and improve, as I continue to live out and work out the salvation, God help me. God help me with my mind as I reach out to others. Help me in my mind as I work in my unit with others. Help me as I, as I deal with my spouse, as I deal with my children, my parents, my grandparents, my coworkers, the strangers on the street. God, help me to have your mind as I deal with this because you know what? It's really stinking hard. Yesterday evening, 
I got so irritated with my kids. And you guys know my daughters. Man, I think my daughters are the greatest. But one text at a tired time was all it took for me to snap back. I wasn't patient. I wasn't kind. I didn't do it the way I should have. Was I completely wrong? No, nope, there's some things we got to deal with. But I didn't do it the way that I could have. I want to improve. I want to get better at that. Am I ever going to be perfect? Heck no. But I am not going to let the fact that I'm never going to be perfect be an excuse to stop trying. Does that make sense? I want to have the mind of Christ. I want to have the attitude of Christ as I continue to know him. And you guys, as, as the worship team comes back up, I, I want you to just focus on that today, if you would. As we worship the Lord and as we invite his presence and we seek him, what are these situations in your life where you can find yourself saying, God, in this situation, help me. And maybe the focus is going to be on just knowing him, surrendering your life to Jesus, because you guys, that's the step one in all of this stuff. Step one is not coming to church. Step one is, I, 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 want, I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I want to know you. Like Paul says in Philippians 3.10, don't get distracted by these guys. I know this is always the risk of bringing these guys up before I'm totally done speaking, but don't get distracted. Like Paul says, I want to know Christ. I want to know him. You guys, putting aside your church attendance and all the scripture you have memorized, do you know Jesus? Because that has to be the first part of this. Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Not do you come to church on Sunday. Not have you been coming to church for 50 years on Sunday. Friends, you can go to church all your life and never be saved. Right, Ron? Do you know Jesus? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus and said, I want you to be Lord and Master of my life? And if not, friends, I want to encourage you, do that today. Do that today. That's the single greatest decision you will ever make in your entire life is a decision to follow Jesus. And let this start today. It's just between your heart and his saying, Jesus, I want to follow you. I confess that I'm a, sin a sinner and I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died, that you were buried, and that you rose again. Forgive me of my sins. I want to follow you. I want to know you. You guys, right where you're at, whether it's right now sitting there or when we ask you to stand, you pray that prayer and you start this relationship with Jesus. The rest of us, unless you've arrived and you have achieved that level where you're just like, you got nothing left to work on. And, I, and if you have, I'd love to sit and talk to you for a few hours because I want to know the secret. Man, just allow the Lord to work in you today. I believe that we can be the, sods, uh, the seeds that are sown that can slowly start getting out and changing. Let us start with us. Amen.